begin with a brief discussion of hermeneutics. What is a hermeneutic? Webster defines it as the study of the methods and principles of interpretation. As it applies to the Bible, it is the study of how to understand the Bible. Most of us would agree on some basic principles in regard to hermeneutics. Number one, we would seek to understand the author's intended meaning. This is sometimes called exegesis, getting the meaning out of the text, as opposed to eisegesis, putting meaning into the text. We want to discover the meaning of the text, not determine the meaning of the text. And we do that through things like context. Number two is all scripture must be taken in its proper context. This means that the interpretation of scripture should be looked at in light of the verse and the book in which the passage is found. The argument of the author and the historical and cultural context should be taken into account. Number three, always compare scripture with other scripture. For example, if one is studying the return of Christ, then one needs to compare passages from Daniel, Isaiah, Ezekiel, Zechariah, Matthew, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, 2nd Peter, Jude, Revelation, etc. Only once all relevant passages have been studied and compared can we be sure of our interpretation. Number four, determine the literal references of figures of speech that provide comparison, substitution, and amplification. Scripture, like any serious literature, uses figures of speech. These include similes, metaphors, hyperbole, idioms, parallelisms. When the Bible wants you to allegorize or take something as a symbol, it will make that clear in some way. For instance, words like like or as or as it were are used. For instance, as sackcloth made of hair. Clearly that's poetic language, yet it is intending to convey some literal truth. In that case, it is that the sun will be darkened just as sackcloth is also dark. Jesus spoke in parables, but he was intending to convey some literal truth. Number five, recognize the near, far implications and applications in prophetic passages. It is common in prophetic literature for there to be a both near application and a far application to a certain prophecy. The letters to the seven churches, for example, in Revelation were relevant to their immediate audience, yet these letters also mention the coming of Christ and are thus relevant to the final generation which will be on the earth when he returns. Another example would be the abomination of desolation. This was prefigured or fulfilled in the time between the Old and New Testaments with Antiochus Epiphanes. Yet, Christ said that we would see it again before his coming, meaning that there is another fulfillment of that prophecy as well. There are no contradictions. If you have a contradiction, you have the wrong hermeneutic. Justin Martyr once said, Since I am entirely convinced that no scripture contradicts another, I will rather acknowledge that I do not understand what is written. There have traditionally been three views of the rapture, pre, mid, and post-trib. However, in 2010, the second edition of the three views on the rapture, published by Zondervan, did away with the second position, mid-tribulational, and replaced it with pre-wrath. This shows that the pre-wrath position is not some fly-by-night view, but can be articulated and defended from a scholarly perspective, and that it has overtaken the mid-tribulational view in many people's minds. And I will suggest that it will ultimately end the rapture debate altogether if it can be given a fair hearing. I think this is actually a good book for one particular reason. It explains the view more or less correctly. Unlike on the internet, where there seems to be a lot of people claiming to critique the pre-wrath view that clearly don't seem to know what the pre-wrath view teaches, and that is one of the greatest obstacles to a true debate on this matter, in my opinion. People are unaware of what this view is actually saying. The book of Revelation gives us very vivid images of the wrath of God. It is symbolized as a scroll. There are seals that are keeping the scroll from being opened. In Revelation 5, 2, it says, who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll? The answer is given, but one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose its seven seals. Christ came the first time as a suffering servant to be the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. The next time he will come in judgment. After all, who is worthy to judge but he who has no sin? Acts 17.31 says, Because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained, he has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead.
I will make a case later on that the seals are not the judgment itself, but only the contents of the scroll are considered God's wrath. In the last days, the wrath of God will be played out during a specific time period called the Day of the Lord. This day is referred to quite a lot in the Old and New Testaments, in fact about 70 times. It is a time period of longer than one day, so don't let that throw you off. The word for day is yom in the Hebrew. It is used both ways in the text, which is always determined by the context. We know that the day of the Lord in prophecy is at least longer than five months because of the fifth trumpet, which is part of the day of the Lord. And that's a plague that lasts about five months. So the day of the Lord is at least that long, but for many reasons it's probably much longer than that. And Christians will be raptured before this time. Many passages speak of the day of the Lord as an unparalleled time of God's wrath. Zephaniah says, Neither their silver nor their gold shall be able to deliver them in the day of the Lord's wrath. But the whole land shall be devoured by the fire of his jealousy, for he will make a speedy riddance of all those who dwell in the land. Isaiah says something interesting about the day of the Lord that will be important as we progress. He says, The loftiness of man shall be bowed down, and the haughtiness of men shall be brought low. The Lord alone will be exalted in that day. The Lord alone will be exalted in that day. In the New Testament, John says that the day of the Lord will be God's wrath in Revelation 6. It says, And said to the mountains and the rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath has come, and who is able to stand? Peter has the same idea when he says, But the heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by the same word, are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Because of the severity of the day of the Lord, God has promised to give the world a sign that his wrath is about to begin. The book of Joel is almost entirely about the day of the Lord, and he says, The sun shall be turned into darkness, and the moon into blood, before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. This is also repeated in the New Testament in the book of Acts, when it says, The sun shall be turned into darkness, and the moon into blood, before that great and notable day of the Lord come. When the signs in the sun, moon, and stars are given, everyone will be terrified. Everyone, that is, except for the righteous people who are told to look forward to this day because it means that their redemption is drawing near. It says in Luke 21, And there will be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and on the earth distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them from fear and the expectation of those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of the heaven will be shaken. Now, when these things begin to happen, look up and lift your heads, because your redemption draws near. Peter also instructs the Christians he wrote to, to look forward to, and even hasten the day of the Lord. He says in Second Peter 3, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with great noise. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God? In every case in Scripture, these signs, the sun, moon, and stars, are to warn the world about the wrath that is about to come on the ungodly. We are told that these things could be used for signs in Genesis 1. Then God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heavens to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs and seasons, and for days and years. One of the most important things to understand is that the persecution of Christians by the Antichrist is not the wrath of God, but instead the wrath of Satan. In Revelation 12 it says, Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you, having great wrath, because he knows that he has a short time. And what does he do with that short time? He makes war against the saints and overcomes them. In Revelation 13, 4, it says, So they worshipped the dragon, who gave authority to the beast, and they worshipped the beast, and he was given authority to continue for 42 months, that's three and a half years, and it was granted to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them.
Some important characteristics of the day of the Lord and the wrath of God are that it is against the wicked, and that when it happens, the Lord alone will be exalted. Satan's wrath, however, seems to be just the opposite. According to the scriptures, it is against the righteous, and that the Antichrist is exalted. We read in 2 Thessalonians 2.4, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. We also know that it is this event, sometimes called the abomination of desolation, where the Antichrist exalts himself, that the persecution of the Christians begins in full swing. Daniel, Matthew, and John in Revelation all tie his bold actions here in the temple, the abomination of desolation, to the start of serious persecution of Christians. But Christ says that this particular persecution will be cut short for the elect's sake, which we're going to get to shortly. God's wrath is what will bring Satan's wrath to an end. God will rescue his people from the Antichrist's persecution and begin the day of the Lord which we have discussed can be a fairly long period of time and is represented by the trumpet judgments and the bowls of wrath in the book of Revelation. Paul says it this way when talking about God's wrath ending the persecution of the church. He says, Since it is a righteous thing with God to repay with tribulation those who trouble you and to give you who are troubled rest with us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who who do not obey the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. This verse, when we look closer at its context, will actually help us to transition into something that I think is really important, and something that the church in the New Testament, as well as the early church fathers, seem to be well aware of, and that is that the rapture and the day of the Lord were back-to-back -back events. It makes perfect sense if you think about it. We're told that we're going to be raptured before God's wrath, and the day of the Lord is God's wrath. And so it would stand to reason that as soon as we are raptured, the wrath would begin. This would also explain all the verses that tell Christians to look forward to and hasten the day of the Lord, or as Luke puts it, to lift up your heads. But yet in the same breath, they speak of it as punishment for the wicked. Paul says here in 2 Thessalonians 1, since it is a righteous thing with God to repay with tribulation those who trouble you and to give you who are troubled rest with us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. These shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power when he comes in that day to be glorified in his saints and to be admired among all those who believe because our testimony among you was believed. Paul says that the repaying of the wicked will happen on the same day of the church's glorification, keeping in mind that this is the beginning of the letter written by Paul to a church that he praises for their patient endurance through what seems to be brutal persecutions. He wrote this letter because they had apparently been taught that they had missed the rapture and were in the day of the Lord because of their torments. This opening of the second letter to the Thessalonians is assuring them that the rapture is still a future event and that the rapture will in fact deliver them from their tribulations when it does happen. As we will see, it is literally impossible to understand the next chapter, 2 Thessalonians 2, one of the most debated verses in rapture history, unless you understand that Paul believed and taught the Thessalonians that the rapture would initiate the day of the Lord. Paul also interchanges the idea of the rapture and the day of the Lord in the most famous rapture verse ever. That is 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. But it's not often noticed because there's a chapter break right in the middle of it. But chapter 5 keeps right on going with the same thought. It says, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And then there's the chapter break. Then it continues, But concerning the times and seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. The subject of this whole passage never changed. They were always talking about the rapture. Paul simply refers to the rapture as the day of the Lord. 
and we're going to see why he does that as we progress. Paul's theology in this regard is demonstrated in almost all of his letters. He says things like, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith, finally there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day. And not to me only, but also to all those who have loved his appearing. So Paul, who is about to be executed, writes that he looks forward to, as we all should, to that day. The D is capitalized in most translations as it's speaking of the day of the Lord. The word appearing here is a pretty rare word. It's only used six times in the New Testament, and all of those by Paul. And it's obvious that he thinks it's the rapture. For instance, looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. And keeping consistent with his theology, he also uses the word to refer to the day of the Lord that will begin to destroy the Antichrist. He says, And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. This idea of deliverance of the righteous and the beginning to judge the wicked on the same day is also taught explicitly by Jesus. And that's probably the reason that Paul is teaching it too. Then he said to the disciples, The days will come when you will desire to see one of the days of the Son of Man, and you will not see it. And as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be also in the days of the Son of Man. They ate, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage, until the day that Noah entered the ark, and the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise, as it was also in the days of Lot, they ate, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built, but on the day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even so, it will be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. So Jesus says that his return will be like the days of Noah. God will deliver his faithful and on the same day begin the destruction of the wicked. There are some that try to say that Noah entered the ark seven days before the rain ever started. And they do this by interpreting this verse in the first part of Genesis 7 in a particular way. And they do this because it would fit a model of the church being protected or raptured seven years before the wrath or rain begins. And it would be really interesting if it was true, but the problem is, is that later on in this same chapter, it explicitly states that they entered the ark the exact same day that the rains began. It says, in the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, in the 17th day of the month, on that day, all the fountains of the great deep were broken up, and the windows of the heaven were opened, and the rain was on the earth for 40 days and 40 nights. On the very same day, Noah and Noah's sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and Noah's wife, and the three wives of his sons with them, entered the ark. Not to mention that holding to this interpretation that they entered the ark seven days before the rains began makes Jesus wrong as well in Luke 17, when he says they ate, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and the floods came and destroyed them all. So they entered the ark, salvation of the righteous, floods came, destruction of the wicked on the same day. It's all over scripture, as Jesus mentions also the same thing with Lot and Sodom and Gomorrah in the same passage, just to make this point clear. So why am I spending so much time with this issue of the back-to-back -back nature of the rapture and the day of the Lord? The reason is because understanding it will help to solve the rapture debate. And number two, there are many people who, in an effort to keep the church out of any persecution, deny that this is true. And we'll see why they do that a little later on. Let's talk about the doctrine of eminence. This is held by pre-tribulationalists, and it's the idea that no events, prophetic or otherwise, need to occur before the rapture happens. In other words, it could have occurred at any moment in the last 2,000 years. This is contrasted with the many events that must precede the day of the Lord. For instance, Joel says that the sun, moon, and star signs must happen before the day of the Lord. Also, Malachi says, See, I will send you the prophet Elijah before the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Israel must be a nation and thus back in its land. The apostasia, or falling away, must happen. The man of sin must declare himself to be God in the temple, according to Second Thessalonians and Matthew 24. Thus, if the rapture and the day of the Lord are back-to-back -back events, the rapture could not have happened for the last 2,000 years. Many verses are used in defense of this theory, like Titus 2.13, which says, We are those who are looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. 
Now here's a list of the Greek words and all the proof texts used in support of eminence, and they're things like looking for and waiting for, waits for, expect, alert or awake, alert, wait, near or at hand, and none of them have the meaning that nothing needs to happen before an event takes place. In fact, without a single exception of every Greek word in every proof text regarding this issue, not a single one of them carry the meaning that no events have to precede Christ's coming. All of the words, save one, are dealing with the believer's attitude concerning his coming, not the timing of it at all. This attitude should be defined as expectancy, not eminence. And that's why some people term this the phantom doctrine. But I don't want to prejudice you against this term, because there is a time period in which the Lord's return will be imminent, but only after certain events take place first. But after they do, it will be imminent. Some pre-tribulationalists appeal to the early church writings, because it seems that many of them believe the rapture to be imminent in their lifetimes. And that is true for some of them. But if you look even closer, you will see that they also believed that the Antichrist was already on the scene, whether it was a Roman emperor or a pope, and that the persecution that they were enduring was the persecution of the Antichrist. They never taught that the rapture could come before the Antichrist until the 1800s. Larry Crutchfield, a professor at Columbia Seminary and a pre-tribulationalist, is an expert on the early church fathers. He wrote a paper called Rudiments of Dispensationalism in the Anti-Nicene Period, and he was looking for pre-tribulationalism in the early church fathers. But he has this to say. Well, there are in the writings of the early fathers seeds from which the doctrine of the pre-tribulation rapture could be developed. It is difficult to find in them an unequivocal statement of the type of eminency usually believed by pre-tribulationalists. In fact, Thomas Ice of the Pre-Trib Research Center quotes Crutchfield in his article, The History of the Doctrine of the Rapture, as his evidence of a belief in an imminent return of Christ in the early church. And he says, Patristic scholar Larry Crutchfield argues that the early church fathers believed in what he calls imminent intra-tribulationalism. That is, they believed that they were in the Great Tribulation, but not the Day of the Lord. He summarizes the views of the pre-tribulational scholars on the issue as follows. With few exceptions, the premillennial fathers of the early church believed that they were living in the last times. Thus, they looked daily for the Lord's imminent return. This belief in the imminent return of Jesus Christ within the context of ongoing persecution has prompted us to broadly label the views of the earliest fathers imminent intratribulationalism. The early church was holding to a more biblical view. We find in Revelation chapter 6 that the only thing that is preventing the beginning of God's judgment of the earth is the number of martyrs be completed. How long, O holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Then a white robe was given to each of them, and it was said to them that they should rest a little while longer until both the number of their fellow servants and their brethren, who would be killed as they were, was completed. A really good example of this is in Matthew 24, where we see this passage. Immediately after the tribulation, that word there is thelipsis in the Greek, of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. Then they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory, and he will send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they will gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. There's so much confusion about this verse, and the reason is because we have defined this word tribulation incorrectly as the wrath of God. And if we do that, then we have to pretend this verse isn't talking about the rapture, even though it's a mirror image of the famous verse in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, as we will see. But if we simply look at how the Greek word delipsis is used in the New Testament, we will see that it is used of affliction or persecution. This is talking about a great affliction being cut short by the rapture. For example, almost every instance of this word, thelipsis, in the New Testament is promising believers they will go through it. Like in Mark 4, verses 16 and 17, where it says, These likewise are the ones sown on stony ground, who when they hear the word, immediately receive it with gladness. And they have no root in themselves, and so endure only for a time. Afterward, when tribulation, or thelipsis, or persecution arises for the word's sake, immediately they stumble. Or, these things I have spoken to you that in me you may have peace. In the world 
you will have tribulation. But be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Or, strengthening the souls of the disciples, exhorting them to continue in the faith, and saying, we must, through many tribulations, enter the kingdom of God. And there are many other verses like this, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, or shall tribulation separate us from the love of Christ? Rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation. We are not going to go through the wrath of God. But to say that we aren't going to go through thelipsis is quite simply unbiblical. So yes, there will be great tribulation, a great thelipsis, the persecution by the Antichrist that Christ describes, but we are promised that we will be raptured out from the midst of it just before the day of the Lord and the wrath of God against the wicked will begin. So before moving on, let's recap some of the basics. The wrath of God is poured out on the day of the Lord. God alone, not the Antichrist, will be exalted on that day. The day of the Lord is a long period of time, at least five months, but probably longer. The sun, moon, and star sign will precede the day of the Lord. The rapture and the day of the Lord are back-to-back -back events, and eminence is not able to be found in Scripture or the early church. Matthew 24 is by far the most critical passage concerning the timing of the rapture. It connects the book of Daniel to the book of Revelation, and it fills in the gaps that will solve the rapture puzzle. But because Matthew 24 describes a persecution of the church before the rapture, many people have had to throw away Matthew 24 to avoid that conclusion, claiming that it was not meant to instruct the church. The reasons we will discuss at length later on, but because of this we are left with an incomplete picture of the end times, and hence the reason for the current rapture debate. One aspect of the debate about Matthew 24's relevance to the church I do feel we should hit before we begin, as it is so crucial to the rest of the discussion, and that is that when Christ tells his disciples in Matthew 24 of the events leading up to his coming, he ends that chronology with a description of the rapture. But because of the implications, if that was true, namely that Christians would endure persecution, pre-tribulationalists have argued that these verses cannot be talking about the rapture, but instead about Armageddon, which is one of the last events that takes place before the millennium. And I will show you why this is an unenviable position to argue, but first let's look at verses 30 and 31 in Matthew 24, and it says, They will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory, and he will send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they will gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. And now let's compare it to 1 Thessalonians 4, which is regarded by everyone, no matter what your view on the rapture is, as the best description of the rapture. It says, For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore comfort one another with these words. We see from this chart put together by Charles Cooper in his book, God's Elect in the Great Tribulation, that Matthew 24, verses 29 through 31, has more in common with 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18 than any other passage that is considered to be a rapture passage. I think Mr. Cooper could have even put an X for evacuation for Matthew 24, as I think it is also implied in the angels gathering together the elect. But even with these numbers, it's still obvious that Matthew 24 is the most similar to 1 Thessalonians 4 than any other passage. You'll find that the early church held the same view about Matthew 24. The Didache, for example, which is the earliest non-canonical writing that we know of, also, here is another interesting example. The King James 1611 edition seems to be pre-wrath in that it considers Matthew 24:31 comparable to 1 Thessalonians 4:16, as well as 1 Corinthians 15:52, both classic rapture passages. Now let's compare Matthew 24 to Revelation 19, the classic Armageddon passage, to see if Matthew 24:31 is speaking of Armageddon like some pre-tribulationalists claim. But first let me explain when Armageddon takes place so that you'll have a reference point. It takes place at the end of the seven-year period and just before the millennium. 
Now, we could argue about when exactly it takes place. I'm under the impression that it takes place at the end of that 30-day period there, but it doesn't really matter for our discussions today. Basically, just know that it takes place sometime right before the millennium begins. Now, back in our Revelation 19 passage, it says, Now I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, and with it he should strike the nations. And he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the birds that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather together for the supper of the great God, that you may eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses, and of those who sit on them, and the flesh of all people, free and slave, both small and great. They do both have angels involved, but it's clear that the function of those angels is very different. For example, in Matthew 24, the angels are gathering together the elect in the clouds to be with Jesus. But in Revelation 19, the angels call birds to feast on the flesh of judged people. So that's not a match. In Revelation 19, there is no trumpet, no evacuation or assembling, nor is the sun and the moon darkened. And most importantly, as we will see very clearly in a moment, the wrath of God is totally over at Revelation 19, but in Matthew 24, the wrath of God is only about to start. So that is definitely not a match. The question that starts everything is from Matthew 24, verse 3. The disciples asked Jesus what kind of signs there would be before his coming. The Greek word for coming used here is parousia, sometimes called parousia. Now, as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us, when will these things be, and what will be the sign of your coming, or parousia, and the end of the age? A quick description of this word parousia might be helpful for our discussion. The word is actually pretty rare in the New Testament. It's only used 24 times. And this is compared with the usual word for coming, which is used 222 times. When this word, parousia, is used of Christ, it is almost used in a technical sense in order to refer to Jesus' coming in the last days. Notice in the definition that this includes and encompasses all the things that Christ will do, starting with the rapture, his visible return, the raising of the dead, but it also includes the last judgment, and also the setting up of the kingdom after Armageddon. The rapture will be the first thing to happen at his coming, or parousia, but there are not multiple parousias, like one parousia at the rapture and then another one at Armageddon. There's only one word that is used to describe all of those tasks. A good example is how this word is used in Greek literature. It was used to describe a visit from a king to the area that the king ruled over. It would be used to refer to his arrival and the entirety of his visit. The parousia, or coming of the king, could last a long time. And that's why the first definition, as you see on your screen, is simply presence. It's no big mystery that Christ describes the events before the rapture in this discourse, because that's what they asked him about. What are going to be the signs of your parousia? And the rapture is the first thing that happens at Christ's parousia. Also, it's interesting to note that Matthew also tacks on the, quote, end of the age to this question, because he understands that Christ's parousia will be linked to the wrath of God, because the disciples had been taught just a few days earlier by Jesus that the harvest of the righteous was to coincide with the end of the age and the destruction of the wicked. In a parable, Christ says, Let both grow together until the harvest, and at the time of the harvest I will say to the reapers, First gather together the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. And then when explaining the parable, he says, The enemy who sowed them is the devil, the harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are the angels. Therefore, as the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the age. And so that gives us an idea of what the disciples were asking Jesus at the beginning of Matthew 24. So Jesus then begins to answer their questions. In Matthew 24, verses 4 through 8, it says, And Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. 
and you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginnings of sorrows. So, he says in the days leading up to his parousia, there's going to be signposts. But he warns us that these should not be confused with the end of the age, or the wrath of God. These signs are only the beginnings of sorrows. The word there is birth pangs in some translations. He's saying that these things are not the baby itself, they're only the signs that the birth is near. What's so amazing is this step-by-step -step chronology in Matthew 24 of the signs leading up to the rapture and the wrath of God and how they are the exact same signs we see in Revelation chapter 6 through 8, which are speaking of the seven seals that need to be opened before the scroll, the wrath of God, can be read. If you have never seen this correlation before, it's something else. So let's take a look at the first match starting in Matthew 24, verse 5. The first thing that Jesus says in response to this question is take heed that no one deceives you for many will come in my name saying I am the Christ and will deceive many. Now if we turn over to Revelation chapter 6 as the first seal is broken it says and I saw when the lamb opened one of the seals and I heard as it were the noise of thunder one of the four beasts saying come and see and I saw and behold a white horse and he that sat on him had a bow and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. Now it's the majority evangelical view here that this writer is the Antichrist and not Christ, mostly because of the company that he's keeping, and also the fact that the Lamb was the one that opened the scroll. And I agree with that interpretation. I also think that there's a tie-in to the first birth pang that Jesus mentions in Matthew 24, because unlike later on, he says that this individual will claim to be the Christ, and that may explain why he's riding a white horse, just as we see Jesus doing many chapters later in Revelation 19. So it may be that he's wanting people to believe that he is the return of Christ. Also because of the bow that is mentioned and the conquering. If you were to read a description of the Antichrist by Daniel the prophet in the Old Testament, you would find that the Antichrist is obsessed with conquering. Christ is nowhere described as having a bow as well, but instead a sword. Also, in Revelation 13, verse 1, the Antichrist's heads have ten crowns, a symbol of authority, and his authority was given to him by Satan in verse 2, which is also a match as we see here with Revelation chapter 6. And for all those reasons, I believe that the first seal corresponds to the first events in Matthew 24. Okay, so we're going to call that one a match and move on to the next one, but the real test will be to see if they continue to match all the way up to the sun, moon, and star sign, and after that. So let's move on to Matthew 24, verse 6. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. Okay, so let's check this out with the second seal in Revelation 6 to see if we have a match. And it says, When the Lamb opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature say, Come. Then another horse came out, a fiery red one, and its rider was given power to take peace from the earth and to make people kill each other. To him was given a large sword. Now that one seems pretty straightforward. Sounds like wars to me, so I think we can call that one a match and move on to the next one. Let's take a look at Matthew 24, verse 7. So we see back here in Matthew that after Jesus says, Nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, he then says, And there will be famines. So let's check the next seal in Revelation chapter 6 for famines. When the Lamb opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Come, and I looked, and there before me was a black horse. Its rider was holding a pair of scales in his hand. Then I heard what sounded like a voice among the four living creatures, saying, Two pounds of wheat for a day's wages, and six pounds of barley for a day's wages, and do not damage the oil and the wine. So, an entire day's worth of work for one loaf of bread, I don't think that anyone would argue here that the third seal is speaking of famine. So famines are a match, and let's move on to the next one, Matthew 24, verse 9. And there we see that Christ describes that people will be hated and killed for his name. All right, so in Revelation 6, it says, When the Lamb opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature say, Come. And I looked, and there before me was a pale horse. Its rider was named Death, and Hades was following close behind him. They were given power over a fourth of the earth to kill by sword, famine and plague, and by the wild beasts of the earth. Okay, a lot to talk about here. 
First, there is a general connection to our Matthew 24 verse, being put to death is the primary point here. But the seal talks of much more than that. And I think the key to showing the connection here is this last phrase, by the wild beasts of the earth. While it's true that God used a sword, famine, and pestilence to discipline Israel in the past, and even wild beasts in Ezekiel 14 verse 21, there's no prophecy of a future judgment of this nature against Israel. One interesting point is that the word for by, as in by the wild beasts, is a different Greek word than the other withs in the verse. The New King James, which I'm using, does reflect this difference, but you can see this clearly if you have a regular King James version. The other withs are Strong's number G1722, called in, and this one is G5259, called hypo. When it says with sword and with famine, that's the Greek word in, but with or by wild beasts is a totally different word in the Greek, and it means something different too. Vincent Word Studies says the preposition by is used here instead of in or with, indicating more definitely the actual agent of destruction. The meaning is defined as under, often meaning under authority, of something working directly as a subordinate. So the first interesting thing is that it seems that the other things in this verse, the killing with sword and famine, are by or under authority of the wild beasts, as the New King James has it translated here. Another interesting thing is that the term wild beast, as some translations have it, has led to some false interpretations. It should be first admitted that wild beast is not the correct translation of the Greek in Revelation 6, 8. The word is thyron, and it basically means beast. And it can be translated as beast, Titus 1.12, or wild beast, as in Acts 11.6. Context determines which translation is best. It's used 39 times in the book of Revelation, and 38 times the term refers to either the beast, as in the Antichrist, or the false prophet, the second beast, or the image of the beast, and it correctly is translated there as beast. However, the translators, attempting to clarify the meaning in Revelation 6 verse 8, incorrectly translated the text as wild beast, the only time it is not translated simply as beast in Revelation. There is no grounds for the translation wild beast in Revelation 6.8, since the beast, Antichrist, in Revelation 13.7, and the false prophet beast of Revelation 13.15, and the image of the beast in Revelation 13.15, all have the power to put to death, just as it says here. Both the beast, Revelation 13.1, and the false prophet, Revelation 13.11, are better reference for the beasts of Revelation 6, verse 8. Both famine and plague, then, are here attributed to the methods in which these beasts kill. That is, in addition to the swords, which is obvious if this is speaking of the Antichrist and false prophet. Famine is something that could be a result of only people having the mark being able to buy or sell, and therefore this could be the cause of this famine. But I also think that both the famine and the plague are things that could be orchestrated by evil people today. The famine in Russia, for example, killed millions of people, and it was largely man-made. It was the result of price controls and requisitioning. Some people say that Lenin was trying to break the spirit of the people and steal their land with it, but that's really conjecture. At the very least, most of the evidence is that Lenin and his associates knew the probable results of their agricultural policies, but were willing to take the risks. According to one of his associates, Pipes, Lenin repeatedly said that he would sooner the whole nation die of hunger than to allow free trade in grain. Plague also could be engineered by the Antichrist and the false prophet with modern super viruses, etc. Or it could simply be the result of the famine. So we will call that one a match and we will move on to the next one. And back in Matthew 24, it says, Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, whoever reads, let him understand, for then there will be great tribulation, such as not been since the beginning of the world until this time, no, nor ever shall be. And unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved, but for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. So verse 15 is the first time in Matthew 24 that we can put a time as to where we are in the scheme of things. He speaks of the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel. And most everyone agrees that this is the midpoint of the last seven-year period. If you want to know more about that, almost any study of Daniel's 70 weeks will bring you up to speed. 
basically there's a final seven year period that will begin when the Antichrist makes a peace agreement with Israel. And at the midpoint, three and a half years in, he will declare himself to be God in the temple. Now, you will find references to this time all over the Bible. Sometimes they call it the abomination of desolation, as it is here. Other times it might say 1,260 days, or 42 months, or time, time, and a half of times, or even a time unlike any other time that has ever been or ever will be. Every time you see one of those phrases or numbers, it's talking about this midpoint right here in Matthew 24. So consequently, we know more about this exact time than any other time in prophetic history, and it will really help us as we progress. Almost every time it's spoken of, it says that this is the beginning of a great persecution of the elect. The entire section here is telling people to flee because of the persecution that will start at that point. So Jesus says Daniel talks about it. Let's turn over to Daniel and see what he says happens right after the abomination of desolation. Daniel 11 says, And they shall defile the sanctuary fortress, and they shall take away the daily sacrifices, and place there the abomination of desolation. Those who do wickedly against the covenant he shall corrupt with flattery, but the people who know their God shall be strong, and carry out great exploits. And those of the people who understand shall instruct many, yet for many days they shall fall by the sword and flame, by captivity and plundering. Now when they fall, they shall be aided with a little help, but many shall join with them by intrigue. And some of those of understanding shall fall to refine them, purify them, and make them white until the time of the end, because it is still for the appointed time. I find it interesting that in the exact same time frame in the book of Daniel, the time just after the abomination of desolation is set up in the temple, Daniel speaks of the same scenario, an intense persecution of the elect of God. I think it's also interesting that we see that God has a particular plan in the deaths of these martyrs, which is also exactly what we see in the next seal in Revelation 6. So let's check it out to see if it's a match. It says, When he opened up the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Then a white robe was given to each of them, and it was said to them that they should rest a little while longer, until both the number of their fellow servants and their brethren who would be killed as they were was completed. So this seal is entirely about martyrs, and that's exactly what we see happening in our Matthew 24 verse. But the most interesting part of the fifth seal is that the martyrs are asking God how long it will be until he judges those that are killing them. And this would seem to indicate that all that has happened so far in the seals, wars, famines, etc., are not part of God's judgment. Also interesting, the reason God waits is because the number of their fellow servants and their brethren would be killed as they were for it to be completed. In Matthew 24, verse 22, it says, And unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved, but for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. Those days are about to be cut short for the elect's sake. These souls are not going to have to wait very much longer for God to avenge them. In fact, it will happen in the very next seal. Okay, so death and the fifth seal martyrs are a match. And we'll move on to the sun, moon, and stars one. And I think this one's going to be pretty obvious. So let's check our Matthew 24 passage first. It says, Immediately after the tribulation, or thalipsis, of those days, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from heaven, and the powers of the heaven will be shaken. Now, if we continue to use Matthew 24 as a guideline for the book of Revelation, we would expect to see this exact same sign there, too. The sign that the day of the Lord and the wrath of God is about to begin. And, in fact, that's what we see in Revelation chapter 6 when it says, I looked, and when he opened the sixth seal, and behold, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became like blood, and the stars of heaven fell to the earth, as a fig tree drops its late figs when it is shaken by a mighty wind. Then the sky receded as a scroll when it is rolled up, and every mountain and island was moved out of its place, and the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, every slave, and every free man, hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks of the mountains, and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne, from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of his wrath has come, and who is able to stand? It seems pretty open and shut here, but there's so much more to this. If we look at Luke 21, which is a parallel passage to Matthew 24, we see Luke talking of this exact same thing. 
He says, And there will be signs in the sun, in the moon, and in the stars, and on the earth, distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them from fear and expectation of those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Now when these things begin to happen, look up and lift your heads, because your redemption draws near. Notice he talks about this idea of men who are terrified for what is about to happen, just like in Revelation chapter 6. This is very important, as we'll see. Also notice that, as we've already talked about, believers will take a totally different view of this event and will not hide, but look up in expectation. That is because the rapture will happen just before the day of the Lord begins. Some of you might be thinking that this passage is speaking of Armageddon because it's sometimes taught that way. But this is the unambiguous start of the day of the Lord with the sun, moon, and star signs, just as Joel prophesied. Armageddon happens just before the millennium. In addition, the very next seal, the seventh seal, is the introduction to the seven trumpets, which proves that they are chronologically linked to the seals, which causes a huge problem because the fifth trumpet, the one about the locusts, is five months long. So the day of the Lord must be at least five months long, and there's simply not enough time for the day of the Lord to be completed if it starts at Armageddon. It must start before then. The rapture will be an event that everyone will know about. The idea of a secret rapture is not biblical at all. This event, the Son of Man coming on the clouds with power and great glory, is an event that everyone will see. All the other lights in the sky have been darkened. People will definitely know when the rapture happens. Now, if this is the correct exegesis of this text, that the wrath of God begins at the sixth seal, it will cause many problems for the pre-tribulational idea. Because for them, the wrath of God was supposed to start before any of the six seals began. So they tend to argue with this verse. The argument is made that the tense of the verb, here translated as has come, is in the errorist tense. And therefore it could mean that the wrath had been coming before this time. This is a flimsy argument for several reasons. The errorist tense is generally speaking timeless. One common use of the aorist tense, as we have in this passage, is the so-called ingressive use of the aorist, and it is in fact used to describe the beginning of something. One biblical example of this is in Mark 14, verses 41 through 43, speaking of Jesus' betrayal in the Garden of Gethsemane. It says, Then he came the third time and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? It is enough. The hour has come. That word there is in the ingressive use of the aorist. Behold, the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. And immediately, while he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, with a great multitude, with swords and clubs, came from the chief priests and the scribes and the elders. The context here is obvious. This has come is referring to the beginning of his passion, not an event in the past. Similarly, the context in the Revelation passage is obvious. The men are hiding themselves because the day of the wrath of the Lamb has come, and it's about to begin. This is consistent with many other scriptures. The sign they saw was what Joel said would happen before the day of the Lord. Also, we see in Luke that the reason why these men were hiding was that they were in expectation of what was about to come. So, if this parallel exists, we should now see the rapture at this point. So let's check our Matthew 24 verse, verses 30 and 31. And this is what happens immediately after the sun, moon, and star sign that we just saw in Matthew 24. It says, Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they will gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. Chapter 7 immediately follows the sixth seal, and we see two events that apparently happen simultaneously. Some of your Bibles will title the seventh chapter as Interlude, because it takes place before the opening of the seventh seal in chapter 8. The first event is the sealing of the 144,000 Jews, 12,000 from each tribe. This protects them from the wrath of God that is about to follow. They will become the first fruits of unsaved Israel in Revelation 14.14. 14. These were not saved until after the rapture, which is why they were not raptured. The other simultaneous event in this chapter is that a multitude of people from every tribe, peoples, and language, which cannot be counted by man, 
appears in heaven. We see the same terminology in chapter 5 about people from every nation, tribe, and language are the ones who are redeemed by Christ from the beginning of time. So let's look a little closer at this multitude that just showed up in heaven to see if it's those that have just been raptured after the sixth seal. Notice that this multitude is clothed in white robes. It appears that these people have bodies. People who are redeemed by Christ won't have bodies in heaven until after the rapture, according to 1 Corinthians 15, verses 15 through 52. Contrast that with the fifth seal, where they were only described as having souls. They were only given white robes and told to wait a little while longer. A great multitude from every nation suddenly showing up in heaven with bodies can only be the rapture. Then John told us specifically who this group is. The elder says that they are those who come out of the great tribulation. This is the tribulation specifically spoken of by Christ in Matthew 24, verse 21 through 22. For then there will be great tribulation, such as not been since the beginning of the world until this time, no, nor ever shall be, and unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved, but for the elect's sake those days will be shortened. And later Jesus says, immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light, and the stars will fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with great power and glory, and he will send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they will gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. This phrase, out of, in Revelation 7, is from the Greek preposition ek, and has the connotation of out from the middle of. The pre-tribulational viewpoint here is that this multitude, which no one can number, are those people who became Christians after the rapture. Remember, if this is talking about the rapture, it would mean that the church goes through persecution before the rapture. So they argue here concerning a verb tense again. They say that the word come in this verse should instead be translated who are coming. They say that the word for come is a present participle that is often translated as coming. The idea that they're trying to convey is that this group does not arrive suddenly in heaven, but that they have been trickling in as they have been martyred. The problem for them is that the time of the Greek sentence is fixed by the verb of a sentence in its context, not by a participle. In this example, the participle phrase, these are the ones who come out of the great tribulation, is attached to two Greek verbs in the aorist tense, washed and made and both referring to an event that has already been completed before the eyes of the onlookers. The point is, is that these words tell us the timing of the phrase, not the participle. This is also why one of the elders refers to this multitude as having already arrived when he says, and where did they come from? If the elder was witnessing an ever-increasing number of people, this would not be the appropriate tense to use. If this parallel continues, we should expect to see the beginning of the wrath of God next in the seventh seal. The sign has been given, warning the world of God's impending wrath. The righteous are now raptured and safe in heaven, and now the day of the Lord, the wrath on the wicked, should begin. When he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. And I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. Then another angel having a golden censer. Then the angel took the censer, filled it with fire from the altar, and threw it to the earth. And there were noises, thunderings, lightnings, and an earthquake. So the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. The first angel sounded, and hail and fire followed, mingled with blood. And they were thrown to the earth, and a third of the trees were burned up, and all the green grass was burned up. A few things to notice here. First, the idea of silence in heaven. There is usually at least praising of God by the cherubim that hold up his throne. But that seems to stop for half an hour as the soberness of what is about to happen sinks in. Almost 6,000 years of God's patience with the wicked is about to run out. So we see the contrast here. While the six seals were bad, wars and famines, persecutions, it pales in comparison to just day one of the wrath of God, in which a third of the trees are burned up and all the green grass is burned up. So I think that there's enough evidence to convict here that these two passages are parallel to one another. But we're only just beginning. As we have noted, pre-tribulationalists, like all of us, don't want the church to go through persecution. And so it leaves them with only one option, to essentially disregard Matthew 24. They do this by maintaining that Matthew 24 is primarily instruction for the Jews only, who are converted to Christ after the rapture, and that the rapture happens sometime before these events in Matthew 24. They say that when Jesus spoke these words to the apostles, 
he was speaking only to their Jewishness and not to their fathers of the Christian churchness. They say things like, Matthew was a Jew and so was his gospel audience. There's lots of problems with this theory about Matthew 24. Number one is the parousia problem. All over the New Testament, Christians are told to look forward to the parousia as if it were their redemption. And we've seen this many times. And this is what the entire question in Matthew 24 is all about. Lord, what will be the sign of your parousia? Also, Luke and Mark give essentially the same accounts of this teaching from the Lord on the Mount of Olives that we see in Matthew 24. And Luke, who was a Gentile, makes it clear that he's writing his gospel specifically to another Gentile named Theophilus. If Matthew is such a Jewish gospel, how come Matthew is the only gospel writer to report Jesus' use of the term church? Jesus first mentions the church by name in Matthew 16, verse 18, and he actually gives instruction for church discipline in Matthew 18, verses 15 through 20. Jesus institutes the Lord's Supper, we see the Great Commission, and many other things. One could easily argue that Matthew is the most church-specific gospel. Ask a pre-tribulationalist if it's okay to set a date for the rapture, and they will correctly state, no, no man knows the day or the hour. But according to their theology, that verse isn't talking about the rapture at all. They seem to agree that Matthew 24, verse 31, is talking about a rapture when it's convenient. We have also already seen how the rapture in Matthew 24, verse 31, compares to all the other rapture passages, as well as how much it doesn't compare to the Armageddon passages that pre-tribulationalists say that it refers to. This view causes some major problems with the text in Matthew 24, too. This first verse that we see here says that people will be delivered to the persecution and that they're hated because of the name of Christ. Jews are not hated because of the name of Christ. Another verse speaks of the elect, and they say that the word elect here is somehow referring to Jews. But this word simply means picked out or chosen. And the definition we read here is to obtain salvation through Christ. It is also used in the New Testament a few times to speak of the Messiah once of angels or Christian individuals. For instance, 3 John writes of the elect lady. And here is a verse that exemplifies its primary usage at the bottom. But the word is never used in the New Testament to refer to Jews. Two textual points that people will bring up to prove the position that Matthew 24 is for the Jews are found in this passage. So let's read it really carefully to see if we can get the context right. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, whoever reads, let him understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let him who is on the housetop not go down to take anything out of his house, and let him who is in the field not go back to get his clothes. But woe to those who are pregnant, and to those who are nursing babies in those days, and pray that your flight may not be in the winter or on the Sabbath." So they'll say, look, this proves that this is for the Jews. It's talking about people living in Judea, and it also mentions the Sabbath. The point of this passage may be best summed up as the word urgency. Apparently, whatever the Antichrist is going to start doing in Jerusalem at this point is going to happen very, very quickly. And in order to avoid the apparently new decree to kill people, you must not look back, just run, particularly if you live in close proximity to it. I think the context shows that the mention of those in Judea is not here to say that this whole passage is for the Jews, but it's mentioned only that because the temple where the Antichrist will make this decree is in Judea, and anyone at all who lives in Judea when this happens will need to run really fast if they want to escape alive. The mention of the Sabbath also makes sense in this context. It's mentioned for the same reason that winter and pregnancy and nursing babies are. All those things would slow down your fleeing. For instance, even today in secular Israel, if you were to try to travel on the Sabbath, you would find it next to impossible to do so effectively. Buses don't run on the Sabbath, trains don't run, etc. Even some elevators operate differently on the Sabbath. You can imagine how if it's this way today in secular Israel, how it might be after their temple has been rebuilt and the religious system is in full effect again, your fleeing would be made very difficult if it were to fall on a Sabbath, the same as if you were pregnant or if it was winter. You can see from this verse that it is not saying that these people shouldn't flee if it's the Sabbath, as if he's talking to Jews under the Old Covenant, as is often suggested. Jesus is quite emphatic that they need to flee regardless. Pray that your flight, he says, your flight is happening either way. 
And as you can see, just because these two verses mention Judea and the Sabbath, it does not mean that this chapter is for Jews. They are only speaking of the events concerning a very important event called the abomination of desolation. If you're still skeptical about Matthew 24's relevance to the church, I think this next section will alleviate all your concerns. Beside the book of Revelation, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians are the most prophetic books in the New Testament. We will see that just like Revelation chapter 6, the Thessalonian letters make the same pre-wrath case in the same sequence as Matthew 24. In fact, I would go so far as to say that primarily what Paul taught the Thessalonians in regard to the rapture amounts to a Bible study of Matthew 24. This shouldn't be a surprise because Paul tells us that his teaching on the end times came from the Lord in 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 15. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. Many people interpret this to mean that Paul had special revelation about the subject of the rapture from Jesus, and while this is certainly possible, I think the only reason they have come to this conclusion is that they don't think that Matthew 24 applies to the church, and so they have never seen the connection between these classic rapture passages and our Lord's plain and simple teaching. This is more than speculation on my part. Look at this list of 20 parallels in 1st and 2nd Thessalonians and Matthew 24. This was put together by Alan Kirshner. These parallels are not supposed to exist if Matthew 24 is not for the church. Look through this list of parallels and follow the references, and I think you will come to the conclusion, just as the early church did, that these two passages are talking about the exact same events, and in the exact same sequence. 2 Thessalonians 2 is by far the most difficult passage for a pre-tribulationalist. I've heard many sermons and read many commentaries on this passage from a pre-trib viewpoint, and almost none of them are the same. Most of them take a different route trying to deal with the problem that their view causes here. Let's read it. Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if from us, as though the day of Christ had come, let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first, and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Paul here in this second letter is trying to reason with the Thessalonians, who had been deceived somehow that they had missed the rapture and were now in the day of the Lord. Paul here is using a pretty good argument to prove that this was not the case. He says that neither the falling away nor the Antichrist revealing himself in the temple had happened, and so therefore the rapture could not have happened yet either. Paul is essentially reminding them of the Bible study he gave them of the Olivet Discourse, or Matthew 24. He's about to remind them of what events need to happen before the gathering together. This exact same phrase in English, gathering together, and Greek, Episynagoge are used by Jesus in Matthew 24 to refer to the rapture. So he's explaining what needs to happen before the gathering together can occur. Well, that's simple, Paul says. Don't you remember the Bible study? Don't you remember that before the gathering together, Jesus told us that the abomination of desolation that Daniel spoke of must happen, which, if you look it up in Daniel, as Jesus instructed them to do, you will see that this is when the man of sin sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. So Paul says, you haven't seen that happen yet, have you? Well then, that's a sign that the gathering together hasn't happened either. The other thing that Paul reminds them of is that a, quote, falling away must happen first. This word is used exclusively in the Bible as a falling away of faith. The Greek word is apostasia. We will talk more in depth about this word later on. So the question is, does Matthew 24 talk about a falling away from the faith that happens before the gathering together can happen? And it does. It says, Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and put you to death, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another, and many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. And because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. So, to visualize this for you, I put a picture of Matthew 24 on the screen, and I will read the Second Thessalonians 2 passage, so you can see the correlation between the two with your own eyes. Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, 
we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled, either by spirit or by word or by letter as if from us, as though the day of Christ had come. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first, and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple as God, showing himself that he is God. I think it's pretty clear when you look at it this way. This is a clear refutation of the pillars of pre-tribulationalism, namely that there are no events that need to happen before the rapture. It would also mean that the Antichrist must be revealed before the rapture. There are two things that are done to explain this problem by pre-tribulationalists. The first is that while they will agree that verse 1 is talking about the rapture, when Paul says, Now, brethren, concerning the coming, or parousia, that word parousia there is the same word used in 1 Thessalonians 4, when Paul is definitely talking about the rapture. So almost no pre-tribulationalist denies that Paul is talking about the rapture in the first verse. But they imply that the rest of the passage is talking about the day of the Lord only. As if Paul said, Hey, everyone, let me talk to you about the rapture. And then he forgot to talk about the rapture and talked about the day of the Lord instead. And this one is solved if you know Paul's theology about the day of the Lord, which he explains, apparently again to the Thessalonians, in the previous chapter, where he describes how the justification of them and the punishment of the wicked all occur on the same day. Paul's theology was that the rapture and the day of the Lord were logically inseparable back-to-back -back events, as we've already detailed. This verse only makes sense if you know that Paul considers the rapture happening on the very day that the day of the Lord begins. The subject in verse 1, the rapture, never changes. When Paul says the day of Christ and that day, he's talking about the parousia, which starts with the rapture. We remember that the parousia is a multi-staged event, so the rapture is theologically inseparable from the day of the Lord as it is the very first event in the Lord's parousia. So let's read it with this in mind, and I'm sure that you'll see that Paul does in fact speak to his brethren about the rapture, as well as the day of the Lord. Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and our gathering together to him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if from us, as though the day of Christ had come, let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first, and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worship, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Some pre-tribulationalists who see the problems in that view take a different route altogether in dealing with Second Thessalonians 2. They will argue that the word falling away, or apostasia in the Greek, means departure, and thus is denoting the rapture in that verse. One popular proponent of this theory is Thomas Ice, who writes for RaptureReady.com. He doesn't appeal to the Greek or to any other contextual argument in the New Testament, but instead to early English translations of the Bible, such as the Geneva Bible, that translates the word apostasia as departure in the English. Therefore, they conclude that the rapture is in view where the word falling away is. So it would read, Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the rapture comes first, and the man of sin, etc., etc. So, for a moment, let's look past the idea that this would mean that Paul is saying that the rapture can't happen until the rapture happens, and let's look at the details of this word. While it is true that some early English Bibles translated the word apostasia as departure, such as the Geneva Bible, it's also equally evident that the Geneva Bible meant a religious departure. In fact, the Greek term apostasia is only used one other time in the New Testament, in Acts 21.21, 21, where the word forsake is the word apostasia. It says, And they have been told about you, that you are teaching all the Jews who are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, telling them not to circumcise their children, nor to walk according to the customs. In the Septuagint, it's used five times in the Old Testament, and every time it means apostasy or rebellion in a religious or political sense, never in a spatial or physical sense. Furthermore, even the very pre-tribulationalist scholar Paul Feinberg, who wrote the argument for the pre-tribulational view in the first edition of The Three Views of the Rapture for Zondervan, admits, quote, If one searches for the uses of the noun apostasy in the 355 occurrences over the 300-year period between the 2nd century B.C. and the 1st century A.D., 
one will not find a single instance where this word refers to a physical departure. This idea of the apostasia being the rapture is sort of a pop view. It's not held among the pre-tribulational scholars in the vast majority. And most good pre-tribulational pastors that I listened to while doing this research openly rejected this view in their sermons. A few verses later, in 2 Thessalonians 2, Paul talks about this enigmatic restrainer. He talks to the Thessalonians like it's old news. I suggest that it was old news, and that Paul got his understanding of the identity and purpose for the restrainer from Matthew 24. Let's read what Paul wrote first. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first and the man of sin is revealed. Do you not remember that when I was still with you I told you these things, and now you know what is restraining, that he may be revealed in his own time? For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way, and then the lawless one will be revealed. The pre-tribulational view teaches that the restrainer is the Holy Spirit, and that he will be removed with the church at the rapture. There is a scriptural problem here, though, because we are told that the Antichrist cannot be revealed until the restrainer is taken out of the way, but we are told that our being gathered together to him will not happen until the Antichrist, or man of lawlessness, is revealed. The logic of the restrainer being the Holy Spirit and being removed at the rapture is an impossibility. The scriptural order is, number one, the restrainer is taken out of the way, and number two, the Antichrist is revealed, and number three, the church raptured. Who then is the restrainer? The answer to the question of who the restrainer is lies in the Old Testament in the book of Daniel, in a parallel verse to Matthew 24, verses 15 through 22. Parallel because this is the section in Daniel about the abomination of desolation, and it's where Jesus told us to turn if we wanted to know what he was talking about. And I'm sure that Paul did in fact turn to Daniel 12, and here he would have found this passage about the abomination of desolation, which says, and at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince, which standeth for the children of thy people. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even to that same time. Some people say that this is Michael standing up to protect his people. But if that's the case, he kind of does a terrible job of it, because the minute he, quote, stands up, there is trouble like has never happened before. And we find out from Zechariah 13 that starting at this very time, two-thirds of Israel, whom he's supposed to be protecting, will be killed. It actually appears that Michael stops restraining at the abomination of desolation. One theory is that he's needed somewhere else at this exact time. In Revelation 12 it says, And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels, and prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now has come salvation and strength, for the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. Therefore rejoice, ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the devil has come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knows that he hath but a short time. And when the dragon saw that he was cast into the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man-child. And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle, that she might fly into the wilderness, into her place, where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time, from the face of the serpent. So this phrase, time, times, and half of times, in Revelation 12, gives us a direct link back to the event in Daniel 7, verse 25, when he's talking about the abomination that causes desolation, and uses this exact same phrase. It is the dragon which gives the beast his power. It would seem that Michael is currently holding back the revealing of the Antichrist, but at some point in the future he will be called to heaven to battle Lucifer. He will prevail over Satan, and he will be cast to the earth. Satan then goes after the woman through the beast whom he gives power to. We see that Michael has apparently been given this particular power to battle with Satan. He is uniquely qualified to restrain the workings of Satan. Remember what Jude said? Quote, Yet Michael the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses. So all Paul had to do was to do as Christ said, and look up the abomination of desolation in Daniel. And what he would have found is this incident where Michael's standing up is a crucial aspect to the timeline of the abomination of desolation. The idea that Michael the Archangel is a restrainer has been peer-reviewed at Oxford Theological Journals, and I would encourage you to take a look at some of the links on your screen for more information about that. So let's finish up by giving you a visual idea of what the pre-wrath view is stating. 
we can see here that the final seven year period is followed by a 30 day period and a 45 day period which the prophet Daniel has spoken about in which the battle of Armageddon takes place now we haven't spoken much about that in this presentation but for more on this 75 day period you can see Albert Sharpie who has a great presentation on this particular issue and then we see the thousand year millennium after that we see here at the beginning of the seven year period the covenant that is made with Israel by the Antichrist I want to point out that it may not be that the public is told that it is a seven-year peace agreement. The Bible simply says it will only last seven years. It's very possible that the public is told that the peace agreement would last forever. It may also be that the public is totally unaware that the agreement has been made. I say this because Matthew 24 verse 15 says, So when you see standing in the holy place the abomination that causes desolation spoken of through the prophet Daniel, let the reader understand. What Jesus said to look for was the abomination of desolation. That does not happen until the midpoint of the 70th week. Based on what Jesus says, it may be possible that we may not know what is happening until we are already at the midpoint. The rapture takes place at an unknown time after the midpoint. It could be hours or it could be years. But let's take a little closer look to be sure we understand. Again, thanks to Elbert Sharpie who put some of these final slides together. The Great Tribulation is the time period between the abomination of desolation, which occurs at the midpoint, this includes the fourth, fifth, and sixth seals of Revelation, and it is cut short by the rapture, which begins the day of the Lord, and God's wrath, which is the seventh seal in Revelation, in which the scroll is finally opened and the wrath begins. We know that the day of the Lord is an outpouring of God's wrath. God's wrath is not mentioned in the book of Revelation before the sixth seal and the day of the Lord but the seals do tell us the tragic events that will take place on the earth under the reign of Antichrist. Therefore, it is evident that God's wrath is poured out after the day of the Lord begins, but it is the wrath of Satan that takes place before the day of the Lord. The Bible teaches that we will suffer persecution, but it also teaches that we will not suffer God's wrath. Let's say for a moment that this view that I just presented is correct. Would anyone here prefer it over the pre-tribulational view? Of course not. Our flesh would much prefer the pre-tribulational view. Therefore, we have to realize how hard it would be for us to change our views if this is correct. If you're a pastor or a teacher, then you know that holding this view would probably mean that you would lose your job. Many pastors and ministers hold the pre-wrath view secretly because they know that their financial support would dry up if they went public and began to teach it. But please, consider the implications. The people that you're teaching are in danger of embracing the Antichrist when he shows up because they're going to be so sure that it can't be the Antichrist because they've been taught by you that he can't show up until the rapture happens. So don't be afraid of this cool new guy. In addition, many Americans are not going to be ready for the persecutions of this type and many will fall away just as Jesus predicted. And I think that Jesus makes it absolutely clear that the reason that they will fall away is because of the persecution that they were unprepared for in conjunction with the false prophets who offer a way out of the persecution by a type of religious compromise. Don't let those who you're teaching be a part of that group. For more references, check out the books and websites on your screen. Remember, the biggest struggle that this view has is people not understanding what exactly it teaches. So first, understand what it teaches by those that are teaching it, and there's a lot more to know. Thanks for your time.